Minister, your, your aunt, Deputy Mary O'Rourke, in a speech last week, reminded her audience of the common origins of Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael. Both parties spring from the old Sinn Féin, before that honourable title was besmirched by more recent events. Sinn Féin means ourselves alone. It was not only the title of the national movement, but the title contained its principal objective that as a nation we will run our own affairs for the betterment of the Irish people. That's what the Patriot did, fought and died for. That was what they achieved, a sovereign Irish state. Now an inept government, through their arrogance and avarice, have given it away. If I could refer to the Irish Times editorial today, which asked whether the men of 19, 1916 died for a bailout from the German Chancellor with a few shillings of sympathy from the British Chancellor on the side. You should be ashamed, Minister, and your colleagues should share your shame. That a Fianna Fáil government should be the one to surrender our sovereignty has its own irony. For years you have posed as the super green patriots and the uncompromising Republicans. Again, I quote from the Irish Times, Fianna Fáil lists among its primary aims the commitment to maintain the status of Ireland as a sovereign state. This is one of your, princip this is one of your principles in, 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 in your party uh, documentation. Uh, your founder, uh, Eamon de Valera, in his inaugural address to the new party in 1926, spoke of the inalienability of the national sovereignty as being fundamental to its beliefs. The Republican Party's ideals are in tatters now. Close, of, clo, clo, close quotation marks, close quotation marks. In every crisis in Ireland, sooner or later, a clown emerges. Last night in Dromolan Castle, Minister Bat O'Keefe took over this role. He assured his audience that the crisis was nothing more than a game of poker. And I quote him, we've got to play poker over the next few days to see what cards these people have to play. <laughs> We should like to see the colour of their money, he says. <laughs> I'm sure his audience from Silicon Valley and Ramolan Castle were suitably impressed. If it's poker, if it's poker you're playing, Minister, it's liar's poker, and that was proved over the weekend. You have no cards left. Your colleagues over the weekend, with their incredible denials, embarrassed the Irish nation. And I'm afraid their denials didn't work. The other strategy you have drawn on from poker is bluff, and you yourself, Minister, are the greatest proponent of bluff that I've ever seen in this House. Absolutely. You and the Taoiseach have been bluffing for weeks now, but the bluff is not working either, and you continue in, in your government to be an embarrassment to the Irish people. You won't speak plainly, you won't share the nation's grief with the people who elected you, you won't tell them what's up ahead, and this morning was a classic example of your ineptitude when the governor of the central bank felt that he had an onus to come out and explain to the Irish people what was happening in the absence of any explanation from the elected government. That's the, that's the unvarnished spoke truth of the situation. The that's the unvarnished speak. truth of the situation. Patrick Honahan, fair dues to him, told the Irish people this morning what your Taoiseach failed under questioning yesterday to tell this House. The origins of this crisis are in your disastrous banking policy. You were warned when you implemented the tour on the road to disaster. You were warned in detail by Fine Gael, who for two years have argued that Anglo-Irish banks should be wound down in an orderly fashion. The concept of moral hazard should be applied. And I'm sure you're hearing from your colleagues in ECOFIN that the concept of moral hazard has to be restored to the European Union. Put very simply, this means that not only those who invested recklessly in Anglo-Irish Bank and lost all their money, and those who borrowed recklessly from Anglo-Irish Bank and lost all their assets, but those who lent recklessly, those who lent recklessly through to Anglo-Irish Bank should also uh, bear the burden and share the pain that everybody else is sharing. Why should reckless lenders who got premium interest rates to lend to cover their risk in lending to Anglo-Irish Bank, why should they be bailed out by the Irish taxpayer? 
yeah. why should the why should the responsibility of repayment transfer to the taxpayer for, from reckless lenders who are getting premium interest rates to, to lend to, le to lend to lend to the bank allow members to speak I'll, without interruption. I'll come to the default strategy and if you read the minister's speech you'll see where he has moved on you probably missed that part of it <laughs> I don't know why the government decided to take over uh, Anglo-Irish bank lock, stock and barrel, but it has never been explained adequately in this House. It has been alleged that there was close social contact between the Taoiseach and the principals of the bank, and that has been advanced as a reason. But that in itself is hardly a credible reason, whether it's a, whether it's a true allegation or not. But the government still has failed to explain their actions. I think you'll recall the headline in one of the American papers, I think it was the New York Times, several months ago, almost 12 months ago. You remember it? It was quoted here. Can one bank bring down a country? Can one bank bring down a country? And what's the answer this morning? Yes. And the answer has to be yes now. One bank can bring down a country. And your banking policy was an absolute disaster. You pursued it in the teeth of opposition here, in the teeth of uh, you know, expert opinion outside this house. And that's what has brought us uh, to this point this morning. As the crisis broke in recent days, the government has been trying to spend themselves out of accept accepting blame for the disaster. The government claimed that it's, it's not really a sovereign problem, it's nearly a bank rescue by the ECB. And of course that's not correct. The IMF doesn't deal with banks. The IMF only deals with sovereign nations. So the fact that the IMF are involved means they're dealing with the sovereign, they're not dealing with the bank directly. The Financial Stability Fund, operating under law out of Berlin, is, it can only deal with Euro states in difficulty. It has no legal mandate whatsoever to de deal with any company in the private sector or with any bank. So the very fact that the source of, part of the source of the funds is from the Financial Stability Fund, and that one of the organizations that are represented in the Department of Finance this morning is the IMF, proves without shadow of doubt that those that are examining Ireland are looking at Ireland Incorporated, and they're seeing it as a rescue an injection of funds into Ireland, a major loan that Ireland can draw on, a bailout for Ireland, and not a bailout for the narrow banking sector. But yet, you continue to spend, you continue to pretend, you continue to uh, not be straight with the Irish people, and you're trying to you know, put a glass in it that this is really an unfortunate event in the banks over which you had little or no control. You've also claimed in your spin that uh, this is a, a European problem, not an Irish problem at all. It's really European action to protect the euro, and Ireland are the innocent victims of, of the strategy. Of course, this is total nonsense. Of course, there has been a knock-on effect from uh, Ireland's problems with its banking sector to Portugal and the bond prices being paid by the Portuguese. And there's an imminent knock-on to Spain. But it's the question to use the word they use, of the contagion spreading from the infection in Ireland. And when the ECB seek to address it, they don't address it in Spain or in Portugal, but like the good doctor, they go back to the source of the infection. And they address it in Ireland. And it's Ireland's problem, and it's Ireland's problem being, that's being addressed, and it's you have put us in the position that we're in, and you can't spin your way out of it. Your speech is interesting. I agree with one aspect of it. Uh, and I, I mean, I join with you in stating that there's no threat uh, to the deposits of Irish people in the Irish banks. Uh, that has been covered, and it's covered adequately under law, and it's covered adequately in Europe. And I'd like to join you in stressing that this morning, because I've had numerable constituents ringing me to know whether they open sterling accounts and move their money out. And you know, that, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy if people act like that. And deposits are secure, deposits are safe, and they should be left in the Irish banking system now that Europe uh, is, is, is taking action. Uh, the second interesting part of your speech is your, the whole section on the special resolution regime. Uh, you look at all the documents that were released to the Public Accounts Committee uh, about banking and about what happened in the lead up to the guarantee in September 2008. One of those documents showed uh, that there was a memo in circulation in the Department of Finance as far back as February 2008, which discussed resolution legislation so that banks could be ordered to wound down. Now, a lot of people, when they see the word resolution, think, you know, it's, it's resolve and it's, it's, it's to solve the Irish banking problem. 
In the technical sense, that's not resolu what resolution means. Resolution is a legal mechanism whereby a bank in trouble may be wound down systematically and uh, you know, those that input into the banks share the burden of the wind down. And you have been promising resolution legislation and your department have been discussing it for nearly three years now. And yet we've seen nothing. We've seen nothing coming from there. But you have moved and you have moved dramatically. A couple of weeks ago you moved and you agreed with the Fine Gael position that subordinated bondholders uh, could be negotiated with and that discounts could be achieved at Anglo-Irish Bank. No, you never. No, no. You, not at all. Not at all. Just, well, why didn't you do it then? You, you, did it when, you did it under pressure on this house. Now you've moved again. You've moved again. Now you're opening the door to the possibility that moral hazard will actually apply in Europe and that negotiations could take place with senior bondholders uh, so that uh, you know, they would share the burden, as you put it, as well. And you warned us in, 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 you know, to disguise the very significant policy move. The discussions are ongoing at EU and international level on the mechanisms that may be available in the future to share the fiscal costs of banks' resolution with senior creditors of banks other than depositors. However, this work remains preliminary and many important legal, financial and commercial hurdles need to be cleared. And, and I mean, but I mean, look at, look at the distance you have moved. You lectured us here in this house saying Fine Gael was talking nonsense. You told us that this was mission impossible, that no negotiations were possible with senior bondholders. You claimed you had legal advice from the Attorney General which made it impossible even to contemplate this. And now you're saying there's preliminary discussions in Europe that moral hazard that moral hazard should apply, that moral hazard should apply in Europe, and that under pressure now from your visitors in the Department of Finance, you're exploring the possibility. You're exploring. He's not. It's it. You've been five years, Mr. Representative. Second last paragraph, page four of the Minister's script. He's saying that. I, I read. I mean, I, I think you're you're living in fantasy land, Deputy Fahey. I wasn't. I, I, I wasn't using my own words. I was quoting the minister. I was quoting the minister. Is it down is it down here? To allow I mean, members to address the House. There may be another version, but I can only quote what the minister circulated. But there's a big policy change this morning where now uh, the government, under pressure from Europe, is contemplating negotiations whereby senior bondholders would not be paid in full for the disaster in the banks. I welcome that. I welcome that. I welcome that. I welcome that. It should have been done years ago, and we wouldn't be in the fix. We, sh we shouldn't be in the fix. We wouldn't be in the fix we're in now. Uh, I, I don't know what uh, mechanism finally is going to be put in place. I presume the minister uh, has a fairly good idea, but he's not sharing his views with the House this morning. Uh, but in his very last sentence, uh, another cat was deliberately let out of the bag. And I quote, it is, it is crucial to complete this process before any decisions are made that have, could have implications for the taxpayer. So obviously, whatever comes in, it's, uh, there are going to be conditions attached. And these conditions could have implications for the taxpayer, and it's important to complete the process before the implications for the taxpayer are seen. And of course, it confirms then why you're deferring the publication of your four-year plan until after the negotiations take place, because there are going to be implications for the Irish taxpayer. Now, could you come clean? Is the Crow Park Agreement going to be shelved? Is there going to be a restructuring of the labour market? Is there going to be initiatives to cut social welfare so that the, profit, property, the, the poverty trap is narrowed? Aren't these, the kind of structural, aren't these the kind of structural changes that people in Europe are looking for? The Irish Times this morning headed their editorial with the question, was it for this? And for the younger members of the House who wouldn't be familiar with Yeats, I'd like to give you the full quotation. Was it for this the wild geese spread the grey wing upon every tide? For this that all the blood was shed? For this that Edward Fitzgerald died and Robert Emmett and Wolf Tone? All the delirium of the brave? Romantic Ireland's dead and gone. It's with O'Leary in the grave. Was it for this that a Fianna Fáil government would finally sell out the sovereignty of the Irish people? The only honourable thing, Minister, that you and your colleagues could now do is resign and allow the Irish people the opportunity to elect a government with a clean mandate to sort out the situation. Yeah. Yeah.